Well, I always expect a small audience on this occasion, but this is smaller than most, actually. Small, but, but perfectly full. I'm just waiting for the head of finance, who knows the answers to all the difficult questions you're going to ask. <coughs> Might as well make a start, I think. Uh, so, good afternoon to everybody, and thank you for coming along. Um, I hope you've all seen a copy of the accounts. We did do what fellows at this event last year asked for, which was to post them on the website in advance as well, so people had a chance to look at them there. And obviously, the purpose of the presentation is to try and help you understand the accounts a little bit better and to give you an opportunity to ask any questions. And uh, as you'd expect, the um, Finance Committee has already reviewed uh, the report and accounts in detail, and Council has approved the financial statements. My gizmo has disappeared. So the annual report falls into four sections. Um, and uh, it complies in, in its format and structure with the statutory requirements on, on charities for reporting. And it covers the four elements uh, listed there on the slide. Uh, and uh, we tried in the, in the narrative part of the report this year to focus on, on outputs rather than achievements. I mean, you'll have a view as to how well we succeeded with that. Um, but um, certainly the Charity Commission expects you to um, uh, and, and actually I mean outcomes rather than outputs uh, and that's what the Charity Commission expects you to demonstrate uh, actual impact um, and uh, so the four areas are the narrative uh, the detailed information on the legal structure governance management and all that uh, the auditors report and then the detailed financial information and um, I should say that um, the annual report and accounts gives you, in, in one sense, a snapshot of the finances of the, of the society in that year. It's obviously influenced by what's gone on the year before, in terms of things like reserves and investments and uh, funds carried over. But it's also, um, it's only approved by the auditors if they think you are a going concern for the year ahead as well, in other words, the year that we're in now. And uh, I'll come back to that at the end, but clearly they did they did take that view. And we've arranged it a bit differently this, this, this time. I hope you find this a, a simpler, if you like, presentation. Um, so some headlines. Uh, first of all, the fellowship. And the fellows' um, subscriptions contribute 21% of our income, so it's clearly an important element. And uh, the graph on this slide shows the trend in the number of fellows um, from 2000, uh, 2013 uh, to October 2019. And it's been pretty static in terms of numbers over that period, uh, with roughly a 100, 100 increase over seven years or so. And that's at a time when, despite the economic situation, I think the heritage sector and interest in the past uh, has, continued, has continued to grow. Uh, there was a dip in 2019, as you can see, caused by 23 resignations and 15 deaths, and then a steady recovery since to the end of October. And uh, between April and October, we've admitted 46 new fellows. And I have to say that one of the things that the Society is really keen to do is to attract more fellows. And you'll know that in the past, Council has talked about a, a, an associate scheme as well, and, and we will be coming back to that in the, in, in, in the next few months. The reason we hadn't taken that forward was because of all the uncertainties about the lease and Burlington House, which I'll also touch on later. So, um, some headline figures on income. Um, income total income for the society, and, and that includes Lucerna, uh, Calm Scott, was uh, 2.66 million, roughly, um, up 16% from the last year. 
and uh, I'll say a bit more about the, the various income streams in a moment. But the point to note, I think, is that that, that increase um, in income uh, last year was mainly because of um, income from um, the Calvin Scott uh, Past, Present and Future project. Um, expenditure. Uh, consolidated expenditure went up by 12% uh, in the course of the year uh, to 2.3 million. Um, and you can see last, fig last year's figure there as well. And the net position, therefore, um, uh, before gains on investments uh, was uh, uh, an increase of uh, uh, net, well, net income of, of 274,764 um, compared to the previous year when it was 218,109. And I'm talking rubbish there because he's given me slightly, or has he given me a slightly different slide? No, he hasn't. Forgive me. That was correct. Um, headline figures on investments. Um, the valuation of, of our investments a, as of today um, is uh, 15,420,928. Um, and uh, we've had a 3% increase in, in our investment portfolio uh, in the course of the year, um, uh, which, is, which is good news. Um, the, uh, but as you can see, um, the, uh, the investments are um, slightly down on, on the 15,768,112 last year, but um, we, have, we have made considerable gains on investments, as it says there. Uh, and, and it's a, a, a three percent improvement, which is good news. They've been our investments have been up and down all year um, as, as the market has uh, responded to various external factors. But um, the current position is reasonably um, healthy. I'll come back to investments again later on as well. Um, and now a slide showing um, income streams, um, and this shows where we get our income from the income which I referred to earlier, uh, in percentages. So um, uh, our major income streams are subscriptions, which as I said are 21%, investment income, which is 21%, um, trading activities, and, and that's Lucerna and Calvin Scott, uh, 18%, donations, <coughs> um, excluding the amounts uh, raised for uh, the Calvin Scott project, 12%, Donations and legacies um, uh, vary very considerably from year to year, as you might expect. Um, but uh, donations and legacies are at 12 percent, or were at 12 percent, uh, and uh, that is um, and, and KPM, uh, KM, uh, Kelmscott, um, uh, Kelmscott, uh income was, was, as I say, 24%. Um, and uh, I think that shows the, the major income of the, the funds coming in from Calmscott on the society's finances. And of course, those, those, the income from Calmscott, which is um, partly donations and partly grant from HLF, um, contributes, uh, makes a substantial contribution to our overheads and our staff costs, which are allocated to it um, appropriately. Um, and a little bit more on um, expenditure. Um, the top three of these, conservation, research and dissemination, are our charitable activities. That's how we, uh, we separate it out, if you like, our cost centres. Uh, conservation is 45% of our expenditure, research 24% and dissemination 19%. And we spend 12% um, uh, of our, our money on, on fundraising. Um, the, um, the expenditure, uh, of, of course, is split between uh, that which comes out of restricted funds and that that comes from unrestricted funds, and we monitor the performance of, of, of those funds very closely. Um, the the um, charitable activities, um, the conservation activity, 
uh, which counts for 45% of the total, uh, includes um, Kelmscott, uh, plus the costs related to the Kelmscott project, plus Morris grants to churches and the care of our own collections. The research activities uh, include the costs of running the library, which is 174,000, support costs on research activities at 166,000, and research grants at 82,000. Um, dissemination counts for 90%, as it says there, and it includes the publications programme, the costs of communicating with fellows, and the running of the lecture programmes. And the overall costs of raising funds are 12% of our expenditure. Um, and and they're, the, they're the costs incurred in raising voluntary income, and they consist of our development office, the cost of sales of the trading company, Lucerna, which is 100 and 190,000 and room hire 85,000. But the actual costs of fundraising, as defined by, for example, the fundraising regulator, which takes a great interest in these things, and we are about to sign up with the fundraising regulator, um, the actual cost of fundraising is about 75,000. So, uh, in terms of the money raised through our fundraising, for Calmscott in particular, but also more broadly, we're getting a lot of bags for our buck. So the support costs that are allocated to uh, charitable activities, and this slide shows the breakdown of maintaining and developing, uh, the breakdown of costs involved in maintaining and developing Burlington House as a viable entity, and that's um, shown in note 7a on page 41 of the accounts, I think. Um, so the, you can see... Um, the impact of the rent that we pay uh, for Burlington House there. Um, and uh, as you know, that rent has in, been in, in increasing in, in, in recent years and is set to increase uh, by a lot more. The actual rent for the 2018 year was 150,917, but that was a considerable increase on what it had been before. And uh, so the, uh, some of the other things that, uh, that uh, count for support costs are professional advice um, and the professional advice particularly that's needed uh, for our negotiations over the, uh, the Burlington House site and uh, also uh, the staff time, um, not least that of the General Secretary in dealing with the, uh, the lease increases and all of the issues around, around the lease. And the next slide will show the dramatic increase in rent that we have, um, we have undergone. Uh, the, uh, the, three, the three lines that you can see there, um, sorry, I'm having trouble seeing. Um, the blue line, um, is accruals uh, as, as, as described in the accounts. Um, the red line is the actual GVA demands, and the grey line is, is, is unrestricted income. And uh, in uh, from 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 2014 to 15 uh, until um, February 2019, there was no in indication of how fast rent would rise, and we assumed on, on throughout those years a 12% annual increase. In order to meet this projected rise, we made some library staff redundant, as you know, uh, as well as uh, many other cost-cutting me uh, measures, and the library restructuring was done also to save 100,000 on rent and pension increases coming in the near future. In 2017, we commissioned a report on options for rent and costs for relocation from Burlington House. So even an increase of 12% per annum as it was then was seen as extremely challenging when our unrestricted income was growing at a far slower rate, as you can see um, from this, from this um, slide. In 2018, we liquidated 655,000 of our unrestricted capital. In other words, we took 655,000 out of our investments. 
in order to pay the estimated back rent and rent up until the end of the present lease uh, period, 2025, as well as other costs such as pension fund increases, which I'll also come back to. And it wasn't until uh, February 2019 that the true extent of rent increases uh, became apparent with the issuing of rent demands for back rent from the government. And these were far higher than uh, we'd accrued for or prepared for and were met by reallocating um, a 527,000 uh, bequest. The remaining amount, together with the, li the liquidated 655,000 of capital, should cover the sal rent up until March 2023. So we've put aside money uh, with difficulty to do that. After that, the continuing rent increases, the escalating rent increases, will have to be paid for either by further liquidation of capital or from other unrestricted income sources. Both of these options will result in cuts to our, would result in cuts to our charitable activities and public benefit. And ultimately, on that basis, the society would have to cease to operate. And to put it simply, the present escalating rent demands are already unaffordable and cannot be paid before March 2023. The other um, fly in the ointment, so to speak, um, and, and none of this is new, and we've explained this in, in, in newsletters to fellows. Uh, the other fly in the ointment are the substantial increases in pension contributions, both uh, the members of the pension scheme and, and the employer. And, and you can see they're set out in this, um, in this slide. So the contribution rates uh, on the right from October 2021 uh, will be 23.7% for the employer. Uh, and and the, the, the two contributions together will total 34.7%. And we've been doing our best, obviously, to influence the discussions over pensions, but we're a very small fish in a very large pond. It's basically the university's pension scheme. So our views don't, don't count for, for a great deal, although you might say that we're disproportionately affected because we're small. Um, so the contributions changed earlier this year, and, and they're the ones you can see um, uh, uh, on, the, on the left of the slide as a result of the 2018 revaluation. And uh, uh, the rates will change again um, from October 2021 uh, as shown in the table, depending on the 2020 valuation, but that's the predicted, uh, the predicted increase. So the impact of that on salaries, as you can see from this slide, is quite um, substantial. Um, and the savings that we made in 2017 by way of staff redundancies have, as you can see, been eroded uh, by pension increases and, to an extent, inflation. And uh, the, the thing to, to um, pick out on this slide is that the, the bars down each side are different, so you have to bear that in mind. But if you look at 2021, then um, the pension uh, the pension costs are something like um, 115,000, okay? And the salary costs are 750,000. Um, those, those pension costs, incidentally, are, are the total of the pension costs that are pay, paid by the employer um, and, and the member. Um, and if you just take out the member's contribution, we, by 2021, will be paying something like 23.7 of, of, of our salary costs will be attributable to pensions. So 23.7% um, is quite a, a large amount towards pensions. Um, the, uh, 
there seems to be very little way out of that one. Um, we could buy ourselves out of the scheme. Um, some of our employees might not appreciate that too much, um, although they're, the scheme is costing them more as well now. Um, but buying ourselves out of the scheme would probably cost us something in the region of three million. And uh, we might not be allowed to do that anyway by the, uh, the pension trustees. Let us um, move on um, to income and the, uh, the statement of financial uh, activities, SOFA, on page 34 of your report is presented in the format um, required by the Charity Commission and uh, this slide is a brief overview of the figures presented on pages 38 to 56 of the report. Um, the, the accounts are split by fund and generally I'll ignore the split and talk about the total, the total figures. Um, so total incoming resources, as, as we've said before, um, were 26, uh, two mil, uh, sorry, 2,634,914 and particular increases were the grants and donations, um, uh, uh, particularly the um, KP, uh, KPP, uh, KMPPF uh, and uh, other income streams are relatively the same as compared to last year. So that's just giving you a little more detail on the income um, uh, that I've given you before. And similarly, a little bit more detail on the, uh, pen, uh, on, on, on the expenditure. Um, again, figures which, uh, which in total I've shown before. a little bit on uh, the Kelmscott past, present and future project. Um, the Kelmscott past, present and future income and expenditure is included in the restricted income funds on page 51 of the accounts as you'll have seen. Um, and uh, the uh, total income uh, for Kelmscott in 2019 uh, was 635, um, 635,405 and uh, that is split between the HLF grant, um, HLF funding received in the financial year of 242,257 <coughs> and the matching funding donations that we've raised and that the staff incidentally have done a tremendous job on, on fundraising for Cabin Scott. Um, and, and, and those amount to 393,148. And just a quick word about the balance sheet, drawing to a close. And the balance sheet that you can see there um, includes Lucerna in the group column. If you look at the, uh, the group column for 2019 on the left of the slide, and it's a review of the full financial assets of the society as of 31st of March this year, in other words, the end of the financial year. And it includes tangible assets, which are improvements to buildings, furnitures, furnishings, equipment and investment funds. It includes uh, investments, uh, which I'll say a little bit more about on the next slide. Um, it includes um, current assets. Um, which includes the stock, for example, at Kelmscott, debtors and gift aid, and annual subs and room hire fees still owing. Uh, liabilities, um, including uh, VAT settlement, grants agreed but not yet paid out, and a proportion of the subs received in January 2019, which gave no benefit uh, to the society until um, after the end of the financial year. And then um, you've got um, the permanent endowment, which is capital funds, the income from which is to be used for specific purposes, and capital cannot be, this, this sort of capital can't be converted to income unless approved by the Charity Commission, and restricted um, capital funds, and those come from specific allocations and appeals by council for particular purposes, uh, research, publications, Kelmscott, Burlington House, and uh, the council can spend that capital uh, if need be, and restricted income, income from permanent endowment funds to be used and applied to, to specific purposes but not yet used. Um, 
and the funds of the charity sector uh, section at the bottom shows our net assets and how they're split by fund. And the group net assets have increased by 709,720, uh, have increased by 709,728. The, uh, a little more uh, on the investments. So the investments that we have consist of Kelmscott Cottages, listed investments, and Kelmscott Cottages is the top line, um, listed investments beneath that, and cash held by the investment manager. And the total um, market value of, of all those in 2019 uh, was 16,279,315. Um, during the financial year, we made a capital drawdown, as I've said before, of 745,000, consisting of 655,000 to meet rising costs, uh, particularly the lease, back, 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 back rent on Burns House, and 90,000 to meet the refurbishment of Camelstock Cottages. And the investment value at 21st of November 2019 uh, is 15,420. Uh, nine, uh, nine, sorry, 15,420,928. And finally, um, the auditor's opinion. Um, fundamentally, um, the auditors were satisfied with the account of the reports, uh, uh, account, uh, the report and accounts. Um, we were we were asked to report by exception on um, on uh, nothing at all, actually. So um, that was that was very good. And uh, uh, I should say that uh, uh, coming back to my point at the beginning of this, that um, the auditors also would not have signed off the reports, uh, the annual report and accounts, uh, unless they thought that the. Um, uh, the society was a going concern. We're a going concern for the time being, um, but uh, as, as you'll have gathered from this presentation, um, we've got a lot to think about in terms of future years through to 2023 and what happens thereafter. Thank you very much. Anybody got any particularly um, burning questions. No? <laughs> well, I hope I haven't baffled you too much. I mean, it sometimes baffles me, but... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Joe? Yes, I, I, I think we can do probably do even more with it as well, but uh, I, I think it's a step in the right direction. Well, thank you very much.